Doesn't okay. that show up in the chat window? Uh, I think so. I think I think we're live. We should be live. Um, yeah. Hopefully we are. Good good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our third installment of um, arranging and composing and compositional ideas with the great Dave Marriott. Dave is a little under the weather, um, but uh, for the most part, he's. we decided that we would uh, forge ahead and get things done at the, the allotted time that we said that we we're going to do this yeah. and keep things going here. So um, we just had a, a we just had a concert on Sunday playing a bunch of uh, new material and concepts that uh, Dave um, added to some of the last tunes. There's a, uh, uh, I believe there's some video of it floating around that we can reference and talk about. But yeah, again, this the is main channel is this. The, it's it's to be the most recent video on this same channel if you're watching this on YouTube. Yes, yes, yes. Um, and uh, let's see. So we're, we're just going to go. And if you guys have questions or anything about things that we're doing, feel free to jump in and ask questions, put them in the comments. Or if you're watching this live or after the fact, um, certainly put in questions that we can and do our best to get to you and answer any questions that you have. So, um, David, I'm going to turn things over to you. Let's go. All right. what you got? So, well, we've done two sessions so far and those two sessions were kind of composition based, right? We want the series to be about composing and arranging. And our first two really focused on composing, getting you started with composing and, and some considerations to have and ways to get you composing, even if you're not really ready to write a fresh melody from scratch on a blank piece of paper. So today we want to kind of assume that you've written a song. You've got your song. It's in lead sheet format of some kind. You've written your melody and the chords are on there. And that's probably all you've written down. And now what do you do? Uh, what, what happens next? Because you're definitely not done with the process. You're done with the composing process, but you're definitely not done with the arranging process. And arranging, uh, you know, it's a tough word. Uh, a lot of people are maybe more familiar with the term orchestration in the classical music world, which is similar to uh, arranging in a way. But I think the easiest explanation of what the art or job of arranging is, is deciding how we are going to play the song. At the end of the day, it's as simple as that. And in the most simple situations, and, and Kareem, you know, we'll, we'll talk about this for a minute, yeah. Uh, the simplest situation where you have to come up with an arrangement is often at a jam session, right? Mm -hmm. You you're you're thrust up on the stage, you quickly figure out what tone tune the group of you want to play, and then you start playing, right? Yep. We we count it off and and hopefully it goes well. But even even in that, there are some assumed things that are going to happen from the arrangement. Kareem, you go up to play all the things you are with a trumpet player and a rhythm section. Yeah. You go all the things you are. Yeah. Great. You start playing the head trumpet player plays the melody. So you step a little bit out of the way bridge comes. He looks at you. You play the melody on the bridge. You look back to him. He plays the last a and plays the first solo. He finishes his solo looks over at you. You play your solo. You finish. You look over at the piano player. Piano player plays a solo. Maybe the piano player looks at the bass player and the bass player goes, yeah, or maybe even waves it off and is like, nope, I don't want to play a solo. <laughs> maybe there's a look over to the drummer like, hey, you want to do something? And and at that point, maybe the horn players get involved and go, is it fours or is it eights or, you know, some twos, you know, whatever. Or maybe it's just this, right? All of those things are part of the arrangement, right? We have, even if, even though it's made on the fly, the decision has been made the order of the soloists and the way the song will be performed. Yeah. Now, these are things that we can all pay a little bit more attention to just when we play our tunes in our own bands. Right. Uh, how many times have you been to a show where mm -hmm. the leader of the band played the first solo every time? Right, right. Like it gets old real fast, right? The order of the of the procession of the tunes, every tune goes, tenor player plays the melody, tenor player plays a solo, piano player plays a solo, bass player plays a solo, tenor player plays the melody. And now we rinse and repeat. And you know what? If you're a listener, that gets old really fast, even if the tunes are different and the tempos are different and all that stuff. Right. Um, so just to go, hey, why don't you blow first? on the second tune or let's all make sure that we alternate you know i had a band with my brother for many years and so it was always a question of who's going to play first and let's make sure that those are flip-flopping every tune yeah. so that 
it starts from a different place. Yeah. Right. That, I want to take that to... Um, adding on to what you're saying conceptually. Um, I believe this was, and this is not uh, correct verbatim, uh, but it's Duke Ellington saying, you know, you have to play, play songs in different keys and you have to play songs in different tempos. And uh, uh, one, you and I hadn't, I was on vacation, coming back from vacation, and we hadn't really talked about music. We were like, all right, you bring some tunes, I'll bring some tunes. And every single song was in the same key. for the, We had the all, of- even, yeah, we had all <laughs> but one tune in the key of F. Right. Even so, though so- I told you what tunes I was bringing. <laughs> Even yeah. you still were like, okay, well, I'll bring these. And then, yeah. and then that one thing isn't a part of your frame of reference. And then right. all of a sudden you go, oh, well, wow, this is now doesn't, this not only sucks as a listener because they're going to hear the same changes in the same key centers, tune after tune after tune. Right. But we as improvisers yeah, are going to start, like, we have to work harder now because yes. like I have lots of great <laughs> stuff I can play on two fives in the key of F. Right. But. Do I have five tunes where it's going to come out completely differently on every single one of those things? Every single, right. Right. not the way I'm not the, with the amount of playing we're all doing these days yeah. uh, and my ears and everything, not 100% activated all the time. Yeah. Absolutely. I'm struggling to, to find new things, force myself to not play the way I played on the last two tunes Right. If we're on our third tune or in a row, and, you know, it's two, five, E and F. For right. Example. And then I've um, gone to, to sessions and, and I've, I've heard um, people have said this about sessions in Seattle. And, and I know it's not true because I've been to somewhere. It's not the case, but like everything is just one tempo, same tempo, same feel, same thing. So not totally. only do you want to, it, not only we're, we can look at this individually as insane energy. And What's that? And same energy, like yes. just mezzo forte, mezzo, mezzo, something without it ever getting intense or exciting or or yes. really, really coming down. Right. Right. So we could look at it from the from the standpoint of composing and arranging an individual song or an entire. You're not just going to do a one song gig. Maybe you are, but usually oh, you're yeah. going to play a whole gig. So you want to compose and arrange that that gig. One of the sessions we will do for this series is specifically going to be about programming, because okay. I think that's. Programming in and of itself is something that isn't ever taught. I, yeah. I mean, I've I've taken you know I'm I have very uh, I have a lot of education at the at a very high level uh, in jazz music, and yeah. no one ever talked to me about programming a set. Yeah. The only conversations I've had with people about programming a set were my high school band director and yeah. why he was picking the tunes we were playing to get us a win. Yeah. And same with my college band director, where it was really those things were really taken into account <laughs> in the in large ensembles yeah. whereas maybe in small ensemble playing uh, that's not that's not put at a high premium of importance let's say right um, yeah. whereas in a big band when you have 20 people you have to work extra hard to make sure it's not just loud or just mezzo or just you know the same thing all the time right um, right <laughs> but, but that, go ahead yeah i was gonna say but back to our set from from sunday yeah um that was our saving grace right was that we had a real mix of feels that one of the tunes was like a two feel blues one of the tunes was an up-tempo swinger one of the tunes was a medium bossa nova yeah. right so there was even though those tunes were all in a row and all in the same key they all had a really different flavor yeah. because we made sure to make sure that it did right. right that was right. our act as arrangers in that such situation to look at right. the tunes that we had and say okay well maybe this one and i remember even on one of the tunes going let's play it a little more up <laughs> and i thought we were gonna do it because of where it is in the set and what we just played and all that yeah. kind of stuff yeah and so yep. Yep. those are all the kinds of, those are all considerations that you you want to have but don't necessarily need to translate to paper they can yeah. And I, I think that that the more you're putting on paper to put in front of your musician, the less you have to say out loud and talk about. So right. at the end of the day, that is better, I think. Yeah. Um, but the more written words you're putting on your sheet music, the less it's about it's the less it's musical information anyway. Right. right? And if it's right. conceptual stuff, then maybe that's something you want to talk to your band about anyway, if they're not if they're not doing these things. Yeah. Now, certainly when we talk about or when we think of arranging we think of great you know the great jazz arrangers yeah. who might some of those people be well gil evans is probably up there on the top of the list bill holman in the sort of more traditional big band world um 
you could say that Mingus and his cadre of of arrangers uh, yeah. fits into that that category. Obviously, the Duke Ellington Billy Strayhorn collaboration um, gets blurred, and who was writing and who was arranging, and and where those things come from. Um, the list goes on. This is all very much about written music at that right. point, with the exception of maybe Mingus, um, where a lot of it was dictated. The arrangements, the trombone, <coughs> you know, Jimmy Nepper, you're going to go like this. And then the second chorus, we're going to come in with you trumpet and saxophone. You come in with this. And then all of the, even though all those lines may or may not have been written. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we've, we've both been fortunate to get to know Bob Hammer, who worked on a lot of those Mingus records. Um, yeah. A lot of it was written down and a lot of it wasn't. And and yeah. a lot of it was misplayed uh, because it wasn't written down. Right. Um, so, but even then there's very specific considerations given to the arc of the very beginning, especially the beginning and the end of these songs, right? Yeah. Whether it's Fables of Phobos or uh, uh, Hora de Cubitus or any of the like classic Mingus Ah Um kind of yeah. stuff. Right. Where it feels like it might have been written, but probably wasn't written nearly as much as we think it was. Right, right. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Something interesting. I'm, I'm going to jump really quick uh, since you mentioned uh, Bomb Hat, Bob Hammer. It made me think of there was a story that uh, Ray Price, a uh, great drummer that uh, lived or lives here. Did he? Is he yeah. still with us? He is. I think so. I okay. Hope I, hope so. Right. I hope so. I hope mean, um, so. I put him in it. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, for those that uh, I don't think he's playing. Uh, as at any more these days from what I've heard. Um, I haven't talked to him in a minute, but for those of you who are not aware about Ray Price, he was a great drummer and uh, um, is a great drummer and worked for some time with Oscar Peterson. And I remember him telling me a story about Oscar. Um, they would play one night. They might play a standard light, let's say, uh, but not for me. They might play mm -hmm. like really medium tempo and uh, they'd play and the audience would think, oh, great, wonderful. And the, so they'd go out and do their standing ovation, you know, do their bow and uh, then Oscar would be like, oh, you know the song, huh? And the next next night he'd come out and play it one, two, one, two, and play it totally different. So even just taking a song, and we discussed this in one of the previous yeah. sessions, you know, taking a song and playing it at a different tempo will give it a whole different feel, which is another form of arranging, you know? Absolutely. And don't, <clears throat> don't be afraid to, you know, once you've written your composition, I think a lot of people forget to do this part of the process. Um, it's more common. It was definitely a more common thing to do in the forties and fifties and sixties and you don't hear people doing it as much, but you know, one of my heroes was the great JJ Johnson, a trombonist. And uh, you know, obviously like every young kid, you go to transcribe uh, some solos from some people. And, and I wanted to, you know, early on, you want to transcribe solos on tunes that, you know, the changes yeah. to right? yeah. transcribing changes is hard when you're a young musician. Right. Yeah. Um, so I was looking for tunes that I knew and I found JJ playing, what is this thing called love? And I found him playing, you know, a bunch of great standards Yeah. and they were never in the key that everybody plays them in. Right. In almost every case, he was shifting the melody to a key that made the most sense for his instrument. Yeah. For the register of his instrument and the timbre and all that sort of thing that, that ultimately the melody to, what is this thing called love in its original key of C is yeah. very low on the trombone at the end. Yeah. Um, and, and, and yes, he did record it in that key as well, but right. he didn't have to worry about the melody uh, by himself. That's in right. a sextet version where Nat Adderley's playing the melody up top and he's playing in a harmony. So it doesn't, all those considerations are gone now, Yeah. but when he's playing at quartet and, or I mean, uh, Stella by starlight, I think is the one now that I'm thinking of. Um, yeah. Uh, th there was in another key and I went, well, okay, why would you do this? <laughs> ah, because it's just better for the trombone. Yeah. So you may have sat at the piano or you may have sat at your instrument and written down your melody and all its chords and all that stuff, but it doesn't have to stay in that key. Once you're done, right. You want to make sure that it's going to be the best sounding key for that melody and set of changes for you to play. If you're the one that's going to be playing it. Yeah. Um, it, it's definitely one of those things that that in this writing project I've been doing for you or where, where I'm arranging a lot of stuff for strings. Um, it gets tricky because your melodies for all of your tunes are written for your instrument <laughs> they work in the register of your instrument where you play them. And that is all. Yeah. So to be able to 
to add something to those melodies is really hard because yeah. it either it either means I'm writing somebody above you um, and now it's obscuring the melody or I'm doing it in octaves and I'm obscuring you being the focal voice. Now, yeah. whoever's up high is going to be that fo that focus. Yeah. And now you're not the feature anymore. And then that's the job. The job is yeah. it's your, it's your gig. Yeah. Well, <laughs> and that, that's the funny thing is like a lot of these times, aside from this project that we're discussing, um, you know, every single week I have to write this music for the live streams. And so I'll, a lot of times I'm in a hurry and I'll write stuff, spend all the time on the piano, never even play through it on my instrument, then get to the gig and play it once it's been transposed. I'm like, oh, this is yeah. not, this is not good. <laughs> you know, how often, so. I mean, I, I'll be honest. I've written tunes for our shows that we've done that I have not had a chance to play on my instrument. Yeah. When I, when I show up there, I have yeah, written that's that almost every week for piano. me. <laughs> yeah. I've written it at the piano. I've written it, you know, here I've gotten it all ready to go. I've played it back. I've listened to it. I hit print and I walk out the door and I come to the gig and I'm, I'm going to assume that I can play it because I wrote it. Um, but as we both know, sometimes you <laughs> run into something that's tricky and you're like, Oh, yeah. I didn't expect that to be tricky. It didn't feel tricky when I wrote it, but because yeah. I'm applying it now to my instrument, it is tricky. There's a technical thing with my instrument that now makes it yeah. problematic, not yeah. the melody itself. I can still hear it fine in my head and sing it and all that stuff. Right. Sure. Which so. leads me to another point. Like um, let's, let's talk about bebop for a minute and some of these things that are very technical and maybe they lay at a, at a, at an, at an slower tempo you can get all the little turns and 16th notes and 32nd notes but i remember you know uh back in high school when i started transcribing different people like i remember doing dexter gordon's version of confirmation well he doesn't put in all the same stuff as charlie parker it depends like if they take some of these things at faster tempos they omit some of those embellishments and they might insist playing like 30 seconds they maybe find a way to phrase those things with eighth notes and it still sounds cool yeah but there's lots verbatim. of those little triplety but lots of the triplet yeah. flips and stuff yeah they get yeah. rid of all that stuff same with like joy spring and and i yes. think that's also an interesting you know you we're talking about bebop i feel like bebop is really the first time that we start to see arranging and composing get fused together all at once yeah. you know you think of uh Oh, what's a good example? Shaw Nuff. Yeah. Uh, Dizzy Gillespie and Charlie Parker, Shaw Nuff. It's got a long introduction yeah. with no, you know, no piano, really. Like it's right. very much just the melody and the drums doing their thing. Um, and then once we get into the tune, then it then it starts to have a different voice. But there's very clearly an introduction that's composed separate from the melody, and it's not really related to what's in the melody, and it's not a piece of the end of the melody tacked on the front. Like it's 100% <laughs> a new piece of material that equals the intro. Yeah. Um, and I think this is where, you know, our, our discussion can become a little bit more specific that up until now, everything that we've talked about kind of falls under the purview of what we think of as a head arrangement. Right. And, and again, I think a lot of people um, misunderstand what a head arrangement is. A head arrangement does not mean that you use the head of the song as your arrangement. I think a lot of people think that that is where the head term in that phrase comes from. No, it's yeah. off the top of your head, right? It is It is a. It is an extemporaneous improvised arrangement. And that's yeah. why it's called a head arrangement. And yeah. usually a head arrangement has very few things to it, right? We might have some riffs. We might have some kind of, some kind of background that might happen underneath a soloist, but even that isn't super common in a head arrangement, especially right. if it's not a large. <clears throat> um, and it's really just about soloistic order potentials for trading, maybe some kind of shout. Like we think of uh, what's a, what's one of the early bebop shouts confirmation has a shout Yeah. right after yeah. the melody is played and everybody plays their solo. We come back and we go. And then drums get to do their thing. And we do that again. And right. then we break for the bridge. So the drummer gets the whole bridge. And then we do that again for the, the first four of the last day. And then he drummer plays the last day and then we can take the tune out. Right. So that's about as heavy an end of, head arranging gets when we start to get into writing arranging we are starting to deal with intros outros codas shout choruses right kind of four big big things that you can add 
after you've created that one page lead sheet to make a quote unquote arrangement. Right. How does yeah. it start? How does it end? And what's something cool that I can put in the middle to break up the monotony of all the solos that are going to happen. Right. Yep. And if that means that there's an interlude, then we put in an interlude. What's one of the great interlude tunes? Night in Tunisia, right? right. Yep. <laughs> it sets up the send off to the solo, right? Yep. yep. So again, that's part of the composition. It was written down. It wasn't like an improvised moment. Obviously, those are some interesting changes on that little interlude. More interesting than a lot of the rest of 19, <laughs> right? Um, and certainly harder to learn. Yeah. Um, so finding things that you can do to add to your tune, to give it a sense of arrangement without having to write out parts for everybody. We're not, we're still not even to that. I'm, I'm hoping to save that kind of discussion for the next topic of like, yeah real pencil to paper nuts and bolts kind of an arranging and we'll talk yeah. a little bit about that at the end to kind of transition us to the next thing a couple yeah. of things that you can do to get started right out of the gate giving a sense of harmony to your melodies and things like that yeah, um, yeah, yeah. but again i feel like that is m more when you're at the point of like, I need to write my trumpet part and my alto part and my tenor part and my piano part and my bass part, and my drum part, right. that stuff sort of can wait till then, but writing an intro, writing an outro, writing a coda, uh, you know, Chick Corea is one of the greats, uh, at this, at having yeah. a melody that's maybe a page or a page and a half, but having an intro that's a page and a coda that's two pages so that now there's new information <laughs> that you get as a listener at the end of the tune. Right. I think, I think especially in jazz music, um, more than a, in a way more than popular music, because at least with popular music, you know, what's coming when you go to hear the band play yeah. your favorite song, right? Yeah. If you go hear kiss or you go hear Britney Spears or you go hear whatever, <laughs> you're you're gonna you're going to ex with the expectation that they are going to play it like the record and your evaluation of their performance is going to be compared to what that sounds like on the record right right we don't do that in jazz yeah. music right the, yeah. the performance on a record is just a moment in time and it'll be like it'll be different the next day and the next hour and the next 10 minutes yep and so i feel like because of that more sameness on a concert weighs heavier on a listener, right? Yeah. Um, because you don't have a point of reference. At least with the popular music, you have the record as your point of reference, the thing that you're comparing it to. But when you're just hearing a jazz performance and you're like, this is boring, but I don't know why, because I have no point of reference, that sucks for your listener because yeah. you can't really give them anything in the middle of the tune at that point, right? Right. Um, the 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 best time you can do that is when you've bored everybody out of their mind with eight solos in a row that don't sound that great coming in with the shout chorus or an an uh, uh, an interlude or some kind of line of new information maybe an extension on the end of the melody right like a coda yeah um i, I we did this on our concert yesterday and you can go or sunday you can go listen to this one of the tunes uh i think it was the bassa getting better uh, yeah. I decided I'm going to write, I'm going to write a soli slash shout, yep. you know, arguably a simplified, so something simpler than I would play in a solo probably. Right. Um, but at the same time of, of higher complexity than the melody. Right. So that there's a sense of contrast. There's a sense of motion that when we finish that exciting moment, it can settle back into the melody. That's a little more mellow and, uh, uh, open feeling, right? It's a light bassa with with the melody across bar lines and things like that. So it's not, but boo boo dee dee, you know, it's not da 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 da, not super rhythmic, right? It's yeah. much more yeah. floaty. And yeah. so it, by having something in the chorus before that's boo doo boo doo 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 boo doo like very linear and line oriented, to have that happen for a chorus and then leave that and come back to a little more open, a little looser, a little more not rubato per se, but not as specific with the sense of time, if you will, Yeah, that makes a big difference to your listener because yep. now there there's a sense of drama. 
Yeah, um, it's it's like textural ideas. You're going from one texture to another texture and giving people something something different. Yeah, I think having like a little bit of a film scoring mentality is is really helpful with like how to perform how to put on a performance and and structure the performance of a composition because yeah. at the above everything else there needs to be a sense of motion right there needs to be a sense of either moving towards something or moving away from something yeah. it can't be in a circle i mean it can but then you better own that that's what we're going to do yeah and make it that so obvious to your listener that we're going to just go in circles and and to get them on board with that because if that's also a hard sell, right? Yeah, <laughs> a four right, bar yeah. tune, let's say, right? Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, there are some guys, there are some musicians uh, that they're going to play the same way for the most part all their career and they sound great at doing that one thing, but it's not the, like for example, someone like Sonny Stitt, he played the same way his whole career for the most part. He changed a little bit and I've transcribed a ton, but whether he's played, it's up-tempo swing, medium swing, ballads, that's what the album is going to be, you know, for the most yeah. part. And his playing's not going to really change, but everything that he does is like near flawless. I mean, but oh, how yeah. many players can you say are going to be? Are, some pl some players can rely solely on their improvisational skills alone, and other players it, it behooves them to have some arrangements to help do some of the work for them. You know. Well, you mentioned Sonny Stitt. I remember when I was about 14, 13, 14, my, you know, my dad and my uncle were the big jazz fans in my life. My uncle would come up from Portland or from the, you know, Corvallis, Oregon, Portland area. Um, yeah. And, and, and of course my dad and uncle would want to go visit Bud's jazz records. Like that was yeah. the move and they would go and we'd get records and we'd come back and we'd listen to them and I would dub them a cassette. So then I would be able <laughs> to listen to them. Um, but I remember there was a, uh, there was a thing that my uncle's friend had made and he just called it the bop quiz and it was a needle drop test it was his yeah. own needle drop test but it wasn't like 10 seconds of a tune it was complete tracks which was awesome it was but it was just unlabeled and it was just a bunch of stuff it was like if you can name what this is you know you're you're heavy and of course i spent most of my teen years trying to figure out what each one of those tracks was and as my knowledge of jazz got bigger i could make better guesses and then once I could make better guesses, I could track down the records with more specificity and all that stuff. One of the tracks on there was a Sonny Stitt version of I Got Rhythm. Mm -hmm. And not Rhythm Changes, yeah. I Got Rhythm. Yeah. And I want to say this is from the 70s, uh, Sonny Stitt in the 70s. I think it's on Muse. Uh, it's not, it's, I can't remember <laughs> the label. I'm not going to speak out of my ass. But mm. You can find this. It's easy to find. He plays tenor and alto on the track. Yeah. And it starts out at the bridge. Yeah. And it starts really slow. I know exactly the you know, I'm sure. Yeah. I mean, if you, listen, yeah, <laughs> if you like Sonny Stitt, you know this, this track. I think the it album is called iconic. Tune Up. I think the it's album called is tune called yep. Tune Up. Yep. Yeah. It's called Tune Up. And it's like, boom. Yeah. We finish out the melody. Yeah, he plays the tag. He plays the tag on it. And now we're in one boom boom. And he and he goes to town and then the piano player plays a solo and guess what? He comes back and he picks up the alto and plays a solo on alto and it's killing too. Yeah. That little thing of an arrangement it to my young jazz brain was like you can do that <laughs> like so you're allowed to do that you can just start in the middle of the song and yeah. you can change tempos <laughs> of the song while you're playing it i mean granted it was double time and all that sort you know yeah. all that sort of thing but to my 13 year old brain that only knew glenn miller and you know big band music I was like, this is so cool that you can make that choice yeah. to just start it this way, to not even play the whole chorus, let alone, you know? Yeah. Um, it's funny you bring that up. That's one of the very oh, first solos of his that I transcribed. That was the first great. album of his that I bought, and that was one of the first solos of his that I transcribed. I mean, it's as good as the Sunny Stitt. I mean, it's later Sunny Stitt, too, but it's yeah. as good as, as anything of his that's out there, I think. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. you know, what else was on that that, <laughs> that 
bop quiz. I think there was some Booker Irvin on there mm. that I finally, once I discovered Mingus, I was like, oh, I know who that is. It was Booker <laughs> Irvin doing uh, Speak Low. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, a bunch of bunch of different things that, but again, you, for me, I was always interested in the writing part as yeah. much as I was the being a good improviser part. And right. so when, you know, whether it's George Russell or I'm trying to think of some other kind of weird or obscure names in the, in the composing and arranging world, George Russell always kind of is at the top of my food chain of like, when I first heard, I didn't, I intuitively understood it, but my, my intellectual brain didn't, mm. you know what I mean? I got the energy and the feel and the sense of it, but the brain power behind why, how they sounded the way they did, you know, the whole Lydian chromatic concept and all that stuff. Yeah. I, I didn't, you know, I didn't know that at first. Yeah. And so you, you hear these sounds and you go, well, why does it sound that way? And I think at the end of the day, we try to go, we try to transcribe, we try to find the sheet music, we try to, you know, get any kind of point of reference so that we can understand yeah. why something sounds the way that it sounds. And more often than not, when it comes to arranging, the way we do that is with scores, right? Yeah. Um, so the, you know, a piece of advice number one is seek out scores to songs that you like. Um, in the in the straight ahead you know, small group jazz world. There's a company called second floor music. They also own uh, jazzleadsheets.com. Um, they own and license the music for dozens and dozens of the greats of the forties, fifties, and sixties. You want to buy Clifford Brown lead sheets that are legal, that are correct, that are legit, that have rhythm section parts. You can do that there. Yeah. You want uh, who's uh, Jim Rotundi or Steve Davis or Jim Snydero, or, I mean, there's lots of modern people that have their stuff here too. And you can get full yeah. scores as it's recorded on the record. You're, are you a fan of Roy Hargrove, the late, great Roy Hargrove? 25 of his tunes are available on this website with perfectly computer copied lead sheets and arrangements exactly the way they are on the record. And they are done with the blessing of the artist. The artists are providing the music. They're providing these lead sheets. They are done with love and care. Yeah. Um, and they're totally correct. Yeah. Um, we live in a town with the great Julian Priester. Yep. You can buy Julian Priester's lead sheets and arrangements on this website. It's the only one I know of. It's yeah. the only place on anywhere in the world on the internet that I know of that you can get published sheet music by Julian Priester. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, collecting these things for yourself, whether they're combo things, for example, I've got a, a thing right here. These are used very often in teaching. They are called the Hal Leonard combo packs. Yeah. If you're not aware of these as a young, if you're a young musician, these are fabulous. They come with usually three or four songs. They come with usually three parts you can see here, they come somewhat flexible. Yep. So you have an, you have line one, line two, and line three. They're all flexible for different instruments. So let's say you want to have alto with soprano and berry. Guess what? You could do that with these parts. But you could also do trumpet, trumpet, and tenor sax, or trumpet, trumpet and trombone like this right. is a super flexible arrangement but what's even better is that each one of these charts comes with a score right so that you can see how the notes are harmonized where there's an intro where there's the melody where's the solo section over here where's the coda there it is how long is it what does it relate to all that kind of stuff right i started buying combo charts um, when I was in high school for 10 bucks a piece that were in print that I could play and I didn't know anything about them. Yeah. I didn't know who the guy who was writing them was. They were published by Kendor. Uh, all I knew is that it said, this sounds like Art Blakey. Yeah. So I ordered it and I'll use that as my, my first piece of how do I dissect this stuff? Let me work backwards. Now I have the cassette tape of the song. I can hear all the parts 
and I can look at all the all of the notes on paper, not the solos, obviously, but but all yeah. of the stuff going into the the performance of the song. Right. Um, this is a super valuable thing and not an expensive thing. In fact, you can find a lot of this stuff for free in PDF online. Yeah. Just type in Dizzy Gillespie score, Bill Holman score PDF in your Google search bar. I yeah. guarantee you will find at least one score for free in PDF that you can then download and spend the next month going over with the recording and putting circles around stuff. Oh, what's the, that, what is going on right there? I love that chord. Why does it sound the way that it sounds? Yeah. What is the rhythm that's going on here? Right. All, anything that you can, that, that brings up a question, you can then use that as your sort of the thing that you're reflecting your sense of skill off of is that, yeah. that, that, that score. Whether it's <clears throat> a Kofiev or Mozart or it's this kind of stuff, it doesn't really matter. Yeah. Um, if, if you're interested in arranging, it will all help. Even something as simple as getting like a pop song lead sheet. This is a, a silly, fun pop song. Don't pull your love. Yeah. This is one of those songs that has... You know, it's kind of a corny song. It was also recorded by Glenn Campbell. Um, but it has one of the all-time great introductions in pop music for trombones. And it gets real corny. Um, <laughs> that's important. That's it right there. There's that intro right there. Yeah. Yeah. It's worth it for this. This piece yeah. of paper is worth it for those four bars. Yeah. And how and when do they use it and where does it come in and how does it relate to this melody that obviously was written first and then this intro tacked on later? Right. How does it connect? How do they make it connect? Um, yeah. all that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, you can't go wrong with study. Yeah. And and I feel like the more you get into the arranging universe, the more it's about study. Yeah. Um there's a book if you're interested in more modern things, there's a book that came out I want to say like 3 years ago from Chuck Schur Music. Um it is a you know, fake book sized book, an inch and a half full size. It is nothing but modern scores. Mm. It's Jim McNeely, it's Maria Schneider, it's John Hollenbeck, right? It's the it's the leading voices in arranging in the last since 2000, let's say, or since the 90s, right? Yeah. Um, it's a fabulous resource because it's full scores, it's notes from the artists, it's all kinds of stuff to give you some <laughs> insight into these tunes. Mm -hmm. Now, we started this conversation talking about like a head arrangement. Right. right. The idea that, that you can do a lot of arranging just on the fly, maybe not even with saying words. Yeah. And and we've moved the conversation a little bit more towards looking back at composing. And maybe I want to compose some new things to add to my to my chart. Right. Yeah. If my if my if my tune is my 32 bar form, then maybe I need to add an eight bar intro or a coda or a tag or something, maybe a background, maybe an inter eight bar interlude between the solo something. Yeah. But what we'll finish here the next 10 or 15 minutes is what can you do that isn't those things that's very simple that gives a sense of arrangement yeah. right? right out of the gate. And again, this is something that you can see. Uh, you can see me try to do a lot in our performance from Sunday. Yeah. Um, you know, Kareem and I bring in these tunes, as I'm sure everybody, anybody else that does these gigs with you does. They bring in these tunes and it's a it's a it's melody. It's a lead sheet. It's 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 yeah. not much more fleshed out than that. Maybe there's an intro. Maybe we, one of us is bothered to write an intro or something. But very rarely, if ever, have I noticed there's harmony. Yeah. Right. It's always I'm getting a trombone transposed version of what <laughs> you're playing with no different information. Right. Yep. So. The number one thing that you can do to make your song sound more like a arrangement is add harmony. 
yeah. somewhere. And yeah. it doesn't need to be everywhere. I think, you know, when we think of, you know, the number one easiest thing to do is just thirds, right? Yeah. Thirds below your melody, whether we're talking about Dizzy Gillespie and, and Charlie Parker or Cannonball and Nat or Miles and Train or JJ and Kai Winding or the list goes on and on and on. Uh, Gigi yeah. Grice and Donald Bird. Uh, this the sense of starting with thirds or at least living right around that interval below your melody does so much. Yeah. Now, the tune that I remember doing this very specifically on because I actually wrote some stuff to do it with for the concert was one of the, it was a tune I did called Caddy Wampus. The idea yeah. was uh, it's a blues, but every other bar is tritone subbed. So it still feels like a blues, but it feels like it's off kilter. It feels like something isn't quite right. Yeah. Again, the definition of Caddy Wampus. Um, <laughs> so the, the thing that I really wanted to make sure is that we would play, you know, it's a blues, so it's a short melody. We're going to play it twice. Um, I wanted to make sure the second time we played it, it had some harmony that it, that it, that it actually got more exciting the second time we play it. Who would have thought we should do something like that? Right. Nobody wants to hear the same shit twice. Sorry. <laughs> Nobody wants to hear it in a row again and again and again. I can put on the record if I want that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It needs to evolve. The music needs to have motion and go somewhere. So by adding some harmony uh, and, and the way I did it is on the front halves of the melody, right? So if it's a, if it's a blues, we have a four bar, for, let me get my fingers in here, a four bar phrase, a four bar phrase and a four bar phrase in the first four bar phrase. Where's my other hand? There we go. My first four bar phrase, we took half of it and I played thirds above the melody and then in the second half of the phrase, I played thirds below the melody so that I'm the lead, you're the lead. I'm the lead, you're the lead. Every two bars in that second conversation of the melody. So now it sounds like something. It sounds like something much more specific than it sounded when we played at Unison. And yeah. honestly, like it's stronger sounding because of that, right? right especially in your situation where we don't have anybody playing chords. Right. Right. We right. don't have a piano player on these gigs or a guitar player. So to hear the color of any one chord on these gigs is huge for the right. listener. Huge. <clears throat> it sticks yeah. out. It's so rare. Right. So the more we can modulate and give them a sense of harmony, the places that there isn't feels, feels like a right balance. Right. right? Instead of it feeling like when there is, oh, this is foreign, it doesn't belong, which it shouldn't feel like that way, but it can yeah. if it doesn't, if, if it's not prepared, right? And right, I think this is right. sort of the, the last part of this discussion that I want to throw out there is that no matter what, you are trying to prepare the listener for what they're going to hear. So, for example, I, I think the, you know, the, the proper arranging term uh, a lot of people like to use is dovetailing that, that leads sort of into this, but that's that idea that, that where one, where one chorus is happening and ends and another chorus begins rather than having those things, you know, stop independently and start independently of each other, there's going to be some, some overlap, right? Yeah. You could think of it as a cross fade of music and, and, and in simplest terms, let's say this part of my phrase is the sax is playing a melody. And then the trumpets are gonna come in here with something else, okay? Ideally, I don't want the, tr the saxophones to end and then the trumpets start because there's no sense musically of that baton handing happening. Right. So I want to, if my saxes are over here on this side and they're gonna go, okay, let's say that's how that phrase ends. And then my trumpets are going to come in here. Well, I want my trumpets to come in here, like yeah. over here. So, right? As my, as my trumpets continue, they come in before the phrase is over. So right. that when we hit that downbeat, we've prepared the listener for what's coming. The yeah. drummer in your band is probably the person that can do, that can, you know, I think we, the word I like with drummers is you can telegraph. Yeah. Right? You can, you can make it sound like we're getting towards something more exciting or less right. exciting you can you can play that shift before the rest of the band gets there 
And that brings everybody to that place, but also prepares the listener for like, oh, hey, it's going to go. It's going to go a different direction from where we just were. Yeah. So that idea that you can, you, you, you want to sort of think aesthetically, think abstractly about the goal of the tune and then kind of work backwards and say, well, what are the things that need to help achieve this? Right. Yeah. I know I can just add some simple harmony and whether it's written or you're just trying to do it on the fly. I think one of the tunes uh, of yours, I remember where it was the confirmation head one Yeah. Uh, where I was like, okay, we're getting to the bridge. Let me try to fill in something on the bridge so yeah. that my bridge has a point of, you know, is a proper point of contrast. Right. Um, I think that's the other thing about form too, that, that is worth mentioning here too, is that if you're writing a tune that has a, a, a larger form, A, A, B, A, A, B, A, C, you know, any of these kinds of things, uh, those places of contrast exist for a reason. So accentuate them, right? Yeah. If you're, Lisa, if, let's, let's use a on green dolphin street as an example, what's the one thing that everybody does with green dolphin street to give it a sense of an arrangement. Oh, the tag at the end, right? Well, no, they play Latin no. and they play swing. Oh, and then they okay. Play I thought you were talking about swing yeah. and then they play Latin and then they play swing. Right. Yeah. Um, everybody does that. Yeah. Right. Like it's very rare that, that you will not start that tune Latin and at some point in time, get some swinging. Yeah. Um, I actually prefer to just play that tune Latin. <laughs> I'd, <laughs> I'd rather, just, I'd rather I, fine, do it on the heads, put some swinging on the heads, but let me be the guy that blows over it in Latin and then have another dude blow over it in, 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 right. in and, and, you know, right. Like make the, the contrast function that way. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but that idea that, that idea that you're just thinking big picture and saying, well, what is my tune and what lends it? What is it? Where does it already lend naturally to applying some of these arranging concepts? So uh, again, uh, AABA tunes, your bridge is your point of, of interest and contrast. So how do you make it sound different than everything you've played in your AA sections? Well, to me, right. if you're playing your AAs in unison, then that means it's harmony or it's at the very least it's octaves instead of unison, right? It's, yeah. a, it's some kind of different sound. Right. Um, and that doesn't, that doesn't take writing down, but it also isn't, it does take a little bit of forethought. It takes yeah. some planning. It's not necessarily like head arrangement uh, material, even though we do this. I mean, uh, ultimately you should be trying to do this um, yeah. when you're playing at a jam session and, and playing a head arrangement with people. You will be perceived as a far better musician if you try to do these things than if you just try to play the melody out of your real book like right. everybody else is going to do. Um, yeah. I mean, there's nothing worse than going up, hearing at a jam session and hearing four horn players scuffle their way through trying to play a melody in unison together when none of them really know how it's supposed to go. Right. And now it doesn't sound good at one. One of them could have just dropped out and just played half note stuff like yeah. counter lines. So again, let's throw out a couple of things that you can do as we wrap up yeah. that are in the middle of writing, but not necessarily have to be written. We just mentioned thirds, like a basic sense of harmony. Thirds is number one. Number two, a simple counter line, right? We go back to Bach and fugues and counterpoint and all that stuff. A simple, simple, just contrary motion counter line of some kind yeah. is super easy to improvise because you can do that very soloistically while your melody player is playing the melody very closely. Now you could yeah. choose to harmonize that melody, but you could also not, and let them be more responsible for the phrasing of the melody. Yeah. Um, what's an example? Pick a tune. What's a tune you like to play? Oh, geez. I mean, uh, way you look tonight. Yeah. That's a nice opening. Like that. So the way you look tonight, right? It has like a little intro, right? Boo do dee da 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 da. And then we get into the ba the A section. We do that thing. There's a little tag at the end. We do it again. We get into the bridge key change. We go to the end. Uh, we get the last A. We do all of that. How could we make this interesting? Well, obviously it's A, A, B, A. So bridge, you play the A's, I play the bridge. That's a super simple thing to do. Yeah. This is also a melody that is uh, not super busy and noty. No. So 
if we go one, two, even if it's really fast, one, two, uh, one, two, three, and you go ba 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 right? Even if you, that, it, we're talking about there, I can go one, two, a uh, one, two, three, four, be da da, be da. Right, I can do real simple counterline half notes, a little yeah. bit of rhythmic stuff, help accentuate where things move, but I don't have to do a lot. Yeah. To at least feel like I'm a part of what's going on, and I can't, and I don't have to write it down. Now, writing it yeah. down could be very helpful. Um, yeah. I, I've definitely, you know, especially on tunes where I have to learn harmony parts. Um, the act of writing it down helps me memorize it. So yeah. I, I can't, uh, I know that, 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 that younger folks have gotten away from the act of writing, you know, taking notes and writing things down. Um, yeah. you know, I, I, I really benefit, I, I know I benefit from writing music down by hand instead of using finale. I'm a, I'm a yeah. professional copyist for almost 30 years. I love using the computer to produce music. I, I, I will always prefer that, yeah. but it don't go in your brain the same way. Yeah. And whether that's taking notes in your English class or your history class in high school or college or writing onto the score and making notes about what you're trying to do or writing out a solo that you're trying to transcribe. Yeah. It will, it will connect with your brain differently. This is not, this is science. You can look it up and yeah. you don't have to take my word for it. Just do yep. a search on the benefits of writing things down. Yep. Uh, you will find that uh, it will change your life. So why not use arranging and composing as a way to do that? Take a piece of, eight, of, of music paper, write just blank measures, four bars to a staff, and write an arrangement with no melody. Go, okay, I'm going to have a four-bar introduction. I'm going to do an eight-bar melody that's the A section. I'm going to do the same thing again, another eight. I'm going to make this my bridge. I'm going to do a, a, a last A, but I'm going to add a tag and I'm going to add four more measures. Then we'll blow and I want to write an interlude too. So I'm going to sculpt after my 32 bars for solo form. I'm going to write, hey, there's going to be eight bars here that needs to be my, my interlude. Yeah. Now you can write one of those pieces every week after that. But now you have the big picture figured out. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a thing. I wish I had one of them. I have one nearby there. It was a thing that uh, a and Records used to do. And they would do a thing called a graphical score. And, and graphical score means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. But this looked more like, a, oh, what's the right term? A Gantt chart. Do they, yeah. People know what a Gantt chart is. It's usually like for project management. It's kind of like a timeline where you have rows. Um, over here, you'd have, over here, you'd have rows. And each row would be like, Pour the concrete, put up the walls, install the windows, install the doors. And there'd be strips of time that would go this way for each of those things. Well, in this type of graphical score, it was instruments and over time. So you're just seeing who was playing and when over the course of the eight minute track. Mm. And that in and of itself is hugely informative because now you can see the density of the players playing and you can compare that to the density of the music that you're hearing. Yeah. Right. 20 people playing versus four people playing versus eight people playing versus 20 people playing. Do I hear that when I listen to the track? Is that reflected? Cause it probably should be. Yeah. Right. So the, something very small like that, you can now extrapolate. You can use that contrafact idea where you're stealing a, the changes of a tune you like, why not steal an arrangement, but substitute your own musical content? In? Yeah, I can tell you uh, for fact, because this person told me this story. <laughs> uh, one of the great big band arrangers alive today is a gentleman named John Clayton. Um, Kareem and I have gotten to know him over the years. He's been in uh, part of the jazz scene in the Northwest at the Jazzport Townsend Workshop and Festival since I was in high school. Uh, and I'm almost 50, so uh, <laughs> it's been a while. Uh, he's been a mentor to me. He's been an employer to me. Um, I've played in his bands many times, play a lot of his music. Um, he's an incredibly deep, heavy, thoughtful arranger. Um, he came up in the Count Basie band, 
right? He is direct lineage. Uh, the Count Basie record on the road on Pablo uh, has J John Clayton playing bass and features John Clayton's first arrangement for the Count Basie band called mm. Blues for Stephanie. Now, as I recall, this was not the first thing that he wrote. I believe he wrote something else and they ran it down and, and Basie didn't like it and was like, cool, next. You know. <laughs> and so what did John do for Blues for Stephanie, which really was the chart that put him on the map? He went back to his favorite Count Basie tune, Splanky. And he said, I'm going to take the arrangement of Splanky and I'm going to just put in my own notes. I want to keep the framework, the form. It starts out with the bassy piano solo. There's a saxophone melody. Second chorus, brass plays the blah, 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 right? Like whatever those things are, that's what he was transcribing. Mm -hmm. And then saying, well, okay, I have the order of events. I just need the events. I just need to plug in <laughs> what the musical content is now. I'm going to take out the melody from Splanky. I'm going to put in my own melody. I'm going to take out the background, right? Yeah. That is how Blues for Stephanie was written. At least that's the way he told the story. Yeah. And it began his career as an arranger. I mean, that that chart is still played. Decades. Oops. Let's let's talk about his arrangement of the national anthem sang by <laughs> kidding, kidding. We're not we're not gonna you go know, there. He he went that's there. What really put him on the map. Uh, yeah, no, no, that, that put him on a much bigger map. <laughs> yeah, if you're not aware, John Clayton wrote the arrangement for Whitney Houston of the Star Spangled Banner uh that won uh both of them a Grammys. Um, yeah. it, it is one of the great versions of the Star Spangled Banner. If you get a chance to go look it up on YouTube, I'm sure it is on YouTube. Uh uh, considering how many bad versions of the Star Spangled Banner on YouTube, <laughs> I'm sure you can find this version, and it is stellar. And I remember it being on TV that day and watching it and hearing it and thinking how amazing it was. And then hearing John's name get mentioned on TV and going, I, I know that guy. How did, did, he... <laughs> did, did he get, did he not get paid for that? What was the, there was some controversy I about know. this. I wouldn't surprise me if the, I mean, I, I know that notoriously the Super Bowl does not pay. Hmm. Um, the halftime show performers don't get paid. So he um, got exposure is what you're saying. You got exposure yeah. for the. And boy, did he ever, his phone yeah. didn't stop ringing for probably a decade after that. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. It was, it was a big, big, big deal. Yeah. Before uh, I forget, um, you know, we talked about, um, the example of the way you look tonight and and uh, doing that. There's a couple of versions off the top of my head if people want to check out some of these ideas that we're mentioning. One is Cannibal Adderley and his brother Nat have a great version of that doing some of the exact same things that David just mentioned. So mm -hmm. check out Cannibal Adderley's version of the way you look tonight. It's at a really fast tempo. They've got some really nice, cool harmony lines that, that they're doing and moving lines. And the solos, of course, are, are amazing. And then another version, <clears throat> there's an album... With, uh, I mean, that song has been recorded by everybody. You can find a lot of people doing these. These are just things off the top of my head to, to yeah. reference some of the things we're discussing right now. Another one, there's an album called Two of a Mind. It's Paul Desmond and Jerry Mulligan. And they right, right. play this. And yeah. to me, it sounds like Bach inventions that are just swinging in the way that they play underneath one another with these. Concepts. Super counterline heavy. Yeah. Counterpoint yeah. and all that stuff. Yeah. Um, what's another one? Uh, Eddie Harris, Love for Sale mm. on the in sound. Uh, it just sounds like... It's fast. It's you know, it's real fast. But when we get to the bridge, there's a new melody hmm. and it's like a solely type melody over the bridge that is referencing the melody. Um, but it's way busier and way more noty and has a whole lot more stuff going on. And I remember hearing that the first time and just thinking, what a great idea. Why have I never heard anybody do this before? It's yeah. so cool when you're just bopping along to a song <laughs> that you know that you've heard a thousand people play. Yeah. And now it's fresh yeah. for the first time in how many hundreds of listenings. It's like, yeah. oh, um, I can I can't recommend listening enough to another one of the great uh, players in our community, Kung Vu, fabulous trumpet players on the, the faculty at the University of Washington now. Um, his version of All the Things You Are hmm. um, is amazing and does not sound like any version of All the Things You Are you've ever heard. I guarantee that. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll send I'll send you a record if, yeah. if you can tell me another record that that sounds like. Um, but, but by all <laughs> means, you know, 
pick the songs that you're already, you know, connected to, whether that's the songs you're writing, because we are talking about a lot of, of composition stuff. So maybe a lot of these things you're applying are to your own compositions, but that's part of the reason that we study the history of the music is to get all, I mean, I didn't get this information from a book. I got this from listening to records, right? This yeah. is how you yeah. learn it. Yeah. So you, you, you have to put this stuff in the context by listening to it. And the best way to do that is through the songs that you already know. We talked about, you know, the way you look tonight. Okay, great. Go to Spotify, do a search for the way you look tonight and click on every jazz version that you can find. And if you don't know which one's a jazz version, then listen to them all for five seconds and you'll know real quick. <laughs> oh, this is, this is like a easy listening vocal version from the sixties. It's not what I, this won't have any solos on it. This isn't what I need. Nothing against Doris Day or June Christie or Ella Fitzgerald or you name it, any singers. Yeah. Um, and, and, and the flip side of that is please people learn these standards from some singers. Yeah. Learn the words and how the song is supposed to be played. I spent three months with a student trying to get him to learn the proper melody to someday my prince will come. And part of the problem was he just refused to try to learn the words. And so he was always playing the rhythms wrong, always right. adding extra notes or forgetting notes. Yeah. And, and I'm like, yeah, but the song goes like this. If you were to sing it, you can't not use this num number of notes, right? Like the words go this. So yeah. you have to use that many notes, not more, yeah. not less. If this is how many it takes. For example, the, all the things you are, what's the first note in all the things you are? It's a whole note and it's you, you, a whole note, R dotted half note, the quarter note promise, kiss of springtime, right? Quarter, 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 quarter. It's a lot. It's a lot. It's, you know, there's not much going on. Yeah. You know, but that's not to say that there can't be, right? That's not to say that that you but you definitely wouldn't go you 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 r r r r <laughs> right? Like Maybe you if you wanted like, that well, you're in a cave. Would never do that, right? <laughs> and yet horn players do this all the time. Ba da 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 da. da. No, you're that is not the song. You have ruined <laughs> a beautiful <laughs> song because now no one can hear the words in their head. Yeah. Um, that, it's the stutter version. It's the stutter yeah, version. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> What's the old the old story? I remember we'll finish with this one. It's the it's the old joke of of I Gary Smullyan told me it as a, as a Sonny Rollins story. I, it's probably just a stupid story, but the story is it's, you know, it's whatever the 50s, 60s and he's in Europe and he's playing with uh, a, a rhythm section and they're playing oh. <laughs> really fast rhythm changes and the bass yeah. player, like many bass players on a fast rhythm changes is doubling up all the roots. He's going boom, 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 right. And after the set, the story, the joke is why, why do, do you, you play, play all, all the, the roots, roots, right? You know? <laughs> yeah. well, it's a good question. Don't do it. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. All right. Well, we'll we'll leave it here. I know you're under the weather. Thank you so much for continuing yeah, to do man. this. I know that you're not feeling up to your your best, but I'm I'm glad we could still make it work. And I yeah, appreciate COVID, it. man. I got it. To, I got diagnosed with COVID today. It's uh, I, I thankfully I'm not feeling terrible, but I don't feel yeah. great. So yeah, 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 um, yeah, yeah. I'm still I'm still functional. <laughs> yes. Well, um. So we're 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 in the for those of you that have been following this series, or maybe this is your first time do this uh, checking this out. Um. This is the third one. Our next one. Hopefully we'll be, I, I know David's busy at the end of next month, but we'll try and get the next one scheduled and we'll be on our schedule hopefully soon. Yeah. Um, and uh, if you have any questions for David or I, let me know. Again, thank you to all of our sponsors. So that's, of course, Ted Brown Music, Can KX, Tacoma Creates, uh, Titus Will Cars, Ed, uh, Edward Jones, financial consultant, Rick Gray, and everybody that uh, checks these things out online or comes out to the concerts. We appreciate it because we could not do it without your support. And that helps us keep all this stuff free and open to the public as much as possible, which is um, a lot um, to be able to do throughout the year. So we greatly appreciate it and hope you enjoy the value, uh, the, enjoy the content and see value in it. And if you do, um, feel free to make a donation online. There's information about how to do that on this post. Um, David, thank you so much. Look forward to uh, doing next month with you and we'll figure out um, different keys for tunes next time. So yeah. <laughs> next time we're going to play them all in B. That's right. Uh, and, That's and, right. You know, just to throw out there too, next time our session will be a little <coughs> bit more um, pencil and paper. We're going to be yeah. doing some stuff with some, you know, a whiteboard with music paper and some, uh, you know, with staff paper and all that sort of stuff. So it'll be a little bit more technical um, if that's something you've been 
hoping for, uh, then you, you're finally going to get something a little bit more technical. If you feel like everything up to now has really been your speed because it has been very sort of general and aesthetic, um, then maybe the next one is one where you maybe just are a little more passive and kind of try to take what you can from it rather than trying to be real specific about, about everything. Um, cool. but yeah, it'll be a little, it'll be a little more nuts and boltsy. Cause I think I know, I know at least some people have asked for a little more of that. Yeah. Yeah. We can do that. We can do that. All right. Thank you so much, David. Thank you so much to our listeners and we'll see you again soon. Have a good one.